Final round of the Marathon Classic at Highland Meadows. And for the first time ever, it was on network television. We have the coverage for you on WTOL. And what a finish it was. Everyone hoping to be holding that trophy right there. Look how beautiful that is. What better person to know that than somebody who played under Woody Hayes for four years, the Hall of Famer, Archie Griffin. Hear what the former Ohio State running back had to say about the rivalry and his memories playing under Woody Hayes. What are some of the memories that stick out to you about playing under Woody? Well, uh, the thing that sticks out with me. Obviously, October baseball is the goal every season that you want to get to. And it wasn't too long ago these fans were lining the streets for the Cavs parade. I am joined by head coach Doug Downing. And obviously a thrilling game that came down to the wire for you guys. I guess what were you telling your team coming down that stretch? What an atmosphere it is here right now. It never gets old. You know, I was able to go to one game in the division series, one game in the championship series, and now seeing game one here for the World Series. It, it doesn't get old seeing that sight. Now the question is, will the Tribe bounce back to take the final win in the four-game series? We go to today's game and Corey Kluber on the mound for Cleveland, but it was a rough start for the righty. And after placing in the top five in two events at the 2016 Rio Paralympics at Sego grad, A.J. Digby is back home. And now for the first time, in a one-on-one -on -one interview with our Danielle Dwyer, Janelle is opening up about what happened that night. It's a story you'll see only here on WTOL 11. When you think about January 15th, what, what comes to your head? It's just a life-changing day and not for the good, I would say. January 15th, 2016. Janelle says she got a text from fellow student athlete Chris Housel about a house party at his off-campus home, asking her if she wanted to come over. So I get there and um, I don't drink and so I always go there as a self-proclaimed DD and then, you know, hang out while I'm there. Janelle says she wasn't even at the party an hour when the night took a turn for the worse. He took air freshener and he was trying to like light that on fire and I told him like, stop it, you're an idiot, you know, you're gonna catch the house on fire basically. But household didn't stop. He was walking towards me and he had um, like a candle kind of like this big lit candle in his hand and um, he was up down to his side I guess he was carrying like a bottle of um, Everclear. The next thing I know like he was he poured it onto the candle and I was on fire that's all I remember. She says she heard people screaming stop drop and roll. Her clothing engulfed in flames until a friend stepped in and ripped her shirt off to help while others used a blanket to put out the fire. I felt like my body just kind of like not necessarily like melting away, but kind of like just like just feeling everything like closing in and I just felt like I was being suffocated. So I was conscious the entire time. I remember trying to scream and not being able to. Janelle was taken by ambulance to the burn unit at Mercy St. Vincent. Over 50% of her body was now covered in second and third degree burns. The ones up here on my chest and my were the deepest and my neck and they were concerned about those a lot. Like they said that if I probably would have burned for seconds longer, I would have died. But it wasn't until she was home from the hospital trying to resume everyday life that the reality of what happened really sank in. It was just a combination of how I looked and what would the future hold for me and like how long is it going to take until things are semi back to normal. Chris Housel was sentenced to four months in jail and community service in a burn unit. And while he will be out of jail in a few months, Janelle will live with these scars for the rest of her life. I'm not him. I don't know what his thoughts are. I'm hoping that like, it will affect him just as long as it has and will me. Wow, what an incredible story. I know you've been covering this from the beginning. What is her recovery process been like into this point? Well, she has been able to 
go and run again. So she's very committed on this road to recovery, getting back to as normal of a life as she possibly mm -hmm. can at this stage. So um, as you mentioned, I've kind of been along for the ride a little right. bit with her and um, I have plenty more coming up. She shares her story about the struggles and the challenges in her road to recovery. Tonight that story will be at 11. All right, thanks so, Danielle, we're yeah. looking forward to that one. Wow, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Now, WTOL 11 Sports, sponsored by Jim White Honda. Thanks to Jim White Honda. Indians looking to bounce back after last night's disastrous eighth inning against Kansas City. We're in the first inning here. Francisco Lindor on first. And Mike Napoli sends that one yard to left. Party at Napoli is pretty appropriate. That two-run shot puts the Tribe up to a quick 2-0 lead. Very similar to last night's game. The difference, they actually won tonight. They added on a few more and come out on top over the Royals 7-3. to The Tigers looking to go 2-0 and in their series against the Twins, but Minnesota had other plans up one zip and in the seventh extend that lead, including this Brian Dozer two-run homer to left. Tigers get fucked 6-2. Mudhens looking for win number two against Pawtucket, but it's the Paw Sox on the board first with this three-run homer to left. Hens try to answer in the bottom of the frame. Casey McGee drives this one to right center, but it's not enough. Hens fall 4-2. Perry's and Ross for getting ready for the upcoming football season. A little seven-on-seven -seven action at Steinecker Stadium. Nice play by Rossford for a gain of 15 yards there. And here Spencer Backus connects with Noah Lenz for seven. Both teams looking good and both coaches saying it's a great way to see how their teams are shaping up before camp. That's why you're doing this stuff in July, so we don't make mistakes in late August and September. So, um, you know, we're looking for guys to compete, run around, and make plays. It's not just standing back there and trying to throw touchdowns. It's trying to fit the ball into small windows and receivers running good routes. And then you go back to, in August and, and reteach the whole thing. So, so far, we're getting out of it what we need to.